Today, I want to open up. You can grab your Bibles. We're going to be looking in the book of Acts. Just find it, and I'll tell you where in just a minute. But as we open up today, I, I've got a story that I came across that I thought, man, this is just incredible. There was a gentleman by the name of Fritz Chrysler, and he was a renowned Austrian-born violinist. I look at a violin, and I just think it's exquisite. It's beautiful. It's, it makes some incredible noises, but I have no clue what to do. You know, I'm afraid of him. But yet this man was a renowned violinist. Wherever he would go, he would attract crowds. Large crowds would follow him, and he made huge sums of money playing the violin. Most of his money, unfortunately, though, he gave away. So when it came time where he could have bought the most exquisite violin that he had ever encountered up to that point in his life, He had no money to do it. How unfortunate. He wasn't prepared. He didn't have what he needed. And yet, he saw that violin, its quality, its design, its its mastery, and and the, the refinery of its quality and the raw materials, the sound that it made. He saw that violin and he was determined. He had to have it. He wanted it. It was just so extraordinary. So he told the person selling it, look, I don't have the money now, but I'm going to go raise the funds and I'm going to be back. Imagine that, that guitar you've always wanted, Junior. And it's, I just can't get it right now. I'll be back. I'll be back. Hold it for me. Just hold on to it. I'm coming to get it. So Fritz worked hard. He saved. And when he finally had enough money, he went back. And finally, that exquisite, beautiful piece of artwork, that instrument of wonderful melodies, that instrument would be his. Pause for dramatic effect. Do you, do you feel where I'm going? Can you just start feeling the emotions and the pain and the frustrations? Because when he gets there, the seller says, I'm sorry, I already sold it to a collector. How tragic. I'm sorry, I've already sold it. And that thing which you so desire, that thing that you so wanted, you can't have. How unfulfilling. Have, 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 any of us here ever left feeling unfulfilled? How many of us at every turn in our lives, at every endeavor and adventure, at every attempt, we accomplish everything we ever wanted? Or do we walk away sometimes feeling unfulfilled? Like something that we needed, something that we wanted, we just could not attain. You know, Think about the frustration when your, child, when your child's wish list item is sold out. Get ready for that, parents. Christmas is coming. And we go in out and buy a whole bunch of stuff. And you get to the store and that one toy, that one thing that your kid wants, sold out. What are you going to do? You know, that, that's trivial though, Pastor Brian. That's trivial. What about the longing for that girl, the one who got away, guys? Oof. The disappointment over a denied loan on that perfect house. This is the house I'm going to have memory. I already pictured the kids already picked out their rooms. What the bank called and said we were not approved. Unfulfilled. What about the absence of a parent's loving approval? The feeling of unfulfilled desire. You know, these are a little bit heavier, and you could, you could substitute them for a myriad of different things. This morning, I want us to explore that the feeling that Fritz had, the feeling that we may have at times when we yearn for something and we don't encounter it. This feeling is not new to us, but there, there's people through the dawn of time who've been experienced this reality. And the Bible captures a story of a man with a similar experience. However, his disappointment was on a much grander scale. He wasn't just pursuing a violin. This man wanted something more. His query wasn't material. And so please turn your Bibles. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. As we continue in our Reboot Discipleship series, we're almost done, I promise you. 
We've been a couple of months here. Why? Because I really want us to reset our minds. Sometimes when we don't shut down the computer, it gets bogged down with performance issues and, and things that should work don't work. And so, you know what? We need to reboot sometimes. As we continue in this series today, I hope that we can reset our hearts concerning another facet of discipleship. I hope that by the end of this message that we've cleared away some of the errors backlogged and, 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 and plaguing our operating system. I hope that by the end of this message we can clear away the errors bogging down the sharing of our faith. The sharing of our faith. Let's begin in verse 26. All right? Are you there? Say amen. Amen. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, uh, to the road, the desert road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah. Father, I thank you for your word, and I ask you, Lord, make this real. Let us sense the pain, the unfulfilled expectations, and God, I pray, let your word richly abide in us. Holy Spirit, minister your word, your truth, as you've done in the past, so do it again, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's set this thing up here for us this morning. The first thing I want you to pay attention to, I want us to consider the man who has a query in this passage, the man who is on a pursuit, on a journey. He is seeking something. We're introduced to him in verse 27. Who is he? An Ethiopian eunuch. We learn a few things about this man, and I want to just draw out two details right there. Ethiopian eunuch. Let's talk about that for a second. First, we learn that he is a foreigner. This man is a tourist. He doesn't belong in Jerusalem, in Israel. He doesn't live in this region. He's not from this culture. He is from Ethiopia. He's come to Israel searching for something. Now, the Ethiopia that's referred to here is, in all probability, the ancient kingdom of Moray. It's an ancient Nubian empire that lay south of Aswan between the first and the sixth cataracts of the Nile. This is not necessarily the Ethiopia that we have today when you look at the map. No. That Ethiopia is the hill country to the east of the upper Nile. That's not where this man is from. Because in the ancient kingdom of Moray, It was a flourishing land. It was a region. It was a lot more land than what we have today as Ethiopia. And in that culture, in that time frame, it was a flourishing society. From about the 8th century BC to the 4th century AD. And in the Old Testament, if we look, there are references to this region. In the Old Testament, they describe this region of Ethiopia as the land and kingdom of Cush. All right? It was known that their kings in this region were viewed as incarnations of the sun god, and they held primarily just a ceremonial position within the kingdom, kind of like the queen of England, highest position, no power. In reality, in, in the kingdom of Ethiopia here, in the kingdom of Moray, it was the queen mothers who held all the power, and they had the title of Candace, or some Bibles say Candake. In this remote region, this advanced culture was the object of much curiosity and much attention by the Greeks and the Romans. And you know what? This region to them in the current view, the current mindset of the people in the first century, when this is being written, they consider the kingdom of Ethiopia to be the boundaries of civilized habitation. That is the ends of the earth, which is very interesting if you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus says, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Okay, just keep that in mind. But let's move on from there. 
This man is a foreigner. He doesn't belong. He's on a field trip, a journey. He is seeking and searching. Secondly, verse 27 tells us that he is a eunuch, an important official. Parents that are here, I'm going to let you all explain the nuances of that detail later on, okay? But in my defense, let me just say, Paul tells Timothy that all scripture is profitable and good for the teaching and training up in righteousness. So you know what? It's not on me. You got to go and do the heavy lifting and sharing the details of that word, okay? But for the rest of us here, let me just say, this man is defined, there's a characteristic that the Bible tells us right there in that word, he's a eunuch, that is very important to our passage, it's very important to our understanding, and it's very important for us if we're going to reboot our ideas of discipleship, especially how to share our faith. Here's something you may not have known. In that time, in the ancient world, slaves were often castrated as boys, and in order for them to be used as keepers of the harem to be used as keepers of the treasury. It was a common practice. And so eunuchs, therefore, were found to be particularly trustworthy. They were considerably, considerably loyal to their masters and rulers. So widespread was this practice of making them into eunuchs that it became synonymous with placing such people in charge of treasuries. I know there's at least one member of our church right now that would be considering the weight of that statement, but we will move on from here, okay? It became so synonymous that eunuchs were assigned to the treasury that sometimes it didn't even make a difference. It didn't necessarily equate that since you are a treasurer, you have gone under the surgeon's knife. No. However, in our passage The Bible tells us two things. It says he was a eunuch, and then it right after says a high official. So because the Bible uses the term, and then it says that he was also a high official, it is most probable that this man was a eunuch in every sense of the word. He had gone through a situation, and this man is also an official. Why, Why does this matter? Here's where these two details start making a difference. The fact that this man is a foreigner and he's a eunuch provides us with shades of meaning. Verse 27, this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. He's not on a diplomatic journey. He's not on a work trip. He's not doing a work assignment. Boss told me to go here, so I'm going here. No, he is on an assignment that is much higher He's on a spiritual journey. This man is seeking some questions. He's on a spiritual mission. And so it's highly probable that this man was a God-fearing man, a man who had heard of the God of the Israelites. He had heard of the, the wonderful exploits of what God had done through his people. He had heard of the miracles, signs, and wonders. And this man is like, I'm curious. Maybe there's some answers for me there. Maybe there's some things that I need to figure out. I need to go there and get more information. He is a God-fearing man. However, maybe he has not done the final steps of saying, I'm going to fully put my name on the dotted line. I'm going to fully convert to believing and living for this God of the Israelites. But here's where the details make a difference. His physical blemish of being a eunuch, his alien status of being a foreigner, wouldn't allow him membership in the congregation of Israel. It wouldn't allow him access. See, Deuteronomy 23, 1, excludes him on access to the assembly of God, to the temple mount, to coming into the holy, to coming into the place where God was said to abide. Why? Because he was physically inferior. You don't have everything going for you, dude. You are broken. You have some deformities. Therefore, you are not allowed to come into the place where God abides and resides. How sad is that? What about this? Because this man is a foreigner, we know if we look at other parts of the Bible that there was a court called the court of Gentiles. That's the only place that they could come into. 
Here's people who are seeking answers and seeking a solution, yet they are not allowed to step into the place where God is said to reside. So much so that in Acts chapter 21, um, Paul, who works with Greeks and people who are considered to be Gentiles, who works with those who are non-Jewish, who would be only relegated to the Gentile court and not able to come into the temple and hear the Torah and and receive the, the scriptures, Paul is accused of bringing people into the temple, and what do they do in Acts 21, verse 28? They start to attempt to stone Paul. He, he's almost stoned because of the idea. It wasn't even proof. People thought he brought foreigners into the temple, so they were going to stone him. Church, friends, I want us to stop and think about this. How sad is it that this man travels hundreds, thousands of miles, and he comes to church seeking answers and seeking a solution, yet he would never be allowed in. To the very most, what would he get? He came all this way, but they would say, you cannot stay in the foyer. Close the doors, he's in the foyer. Turn off the TVs out there, he's in the foyer. How sad is that? He came yearning for an encounter with God. Maybe this man is undergoing the hardest season of his life. Maybe he just experienced some terrible pain and, 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 and some terrible grief in his life. Maybe he said, you know what, I need to take time away from work. I need to get away from my family. I need to get away from this, from that. I need to get away from my culture. I got to go somewhere because what I'm doing, where I'm living, the, the situation that I'm encountering, nothing's changing. And the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And you know what, I got to go. I need to seek an answer. And he goes on this journey. He gets there. And maybe he's searching for meaning, for hope, for for healing, for peace, whatever it is. And what does this man, at the end of his road, this man who has nowhere else to go, maybe in a last-ditch effort before he gives up completely, he says, I'm going to church. And after miles, stay in the foyer. You can't come in. You're not worthy. You're broken. You don't belong. Get out of here. It's clear that this man, I think it's tragic, but it's clear to me if we read the scriptures, sometimes we got to look at details, right? So if we read the scriptures, what does it say that he's doing in verse 28? And on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. There is no mention of a miracle happening in the court of the Gentiles. There is no mention of a God-fearing person coming through to him and saying, man, welcome, I'm glad you're here. What is your story? Let me tell you about Jesus. There is no mention of anything happening. All there is a mention of, this man is sitting in his chariot. He's reading the scrolls. Man, here I go back home, hundreds of miles. I came, I took time off, I'm needing an answer, and I was denied. He's reading the scriptures and there's nothing unfulfilled. Church, can I reboot discipleship here for a minute? No? Okay, then. We'll all set, Pastor Xavier. Let's go home. Can I reboot discipleship here for a second, church? Please forgive me, but I wonder how many we've denied access to. How many have I denied access to? Who have we written off because of their appearance, their personalities, their status, their beliefs, their lifestyle choices? How many have come to church seeking, searching? You know what? They took the initiative like this Ethiopian eunuch. They came, and yet when they got here, they were ignored. How many have we alienated because of our insensitive choice of words or the manner in which we treat one another? Man, I came to church, I need an answer. Wow, that's how they treat each other? They don't forgive one another? Oh, wow, they talk back to each other and behind each other's backs? How many have we failed to engage because of our tepid zeal and our lack of clear answers? How many, church? How many 
facing real pain, hopeless circumstances, impossible odds, devastating addictions, crippling insecurities, and the condemned fact of all eternity without God, suffering in hell, have we allowed to turn back, go home, unfulfilled and empty-handed? I'm going to give a witness to myself because before I preach to anybody else, I'm preaching to myself. And Lord Jesus, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on my heart, on my life, on my (laughs) desires and plans and, and projects and everything else that occupies my time. Because Jesus, there are real people coming to church, needing an answer, seeking you, Lord God. Forgive us, Jesus. Can you just say, Lord, forgive me? Lord, forgive me. Church, let me remind you that the church is not a museum for saints, but it's a hospital for sinners. The church is a hospital for sin. We, the church, should be a beacon of light to the lost soul. We have to be the safe haven for the persecuted. We are supposed to be a healing bomb to those who are hurting. The church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a museum to put up all the people who have it all together. Because reality check, all of our good works are like filthy rags. Reality check, all of us have gone astray. Reality check, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so you know what? This is not a museum for people who've got it together, of which Paul said, I am the chief sinner. I'm just up here, but you know what? I'm in the same boat as you. I need Jesus to save me and forgive me and heal me of my sins. See, we don't gather in church for fellowship. We don't come to God to pray and read our Bibles to express our praise for the sake of tradition. We do so because there is a real lost, hurting world that is in desperate need to encounter a God that is able to do for them what only he can do and nothing else can satisfy. There is a world that needs Jesus, a world that needs God. And so we come together because of this hurting world. We come together because the world is looking for authentic, genuine Christians who know Jesus, who walk with him, and who have hope to share with others. Amen? Go ahead and give God a praise right there. So I want you to understand this man is a foreigner. This man is a eunuch. This man leaves unfulfilled. All right? That's what I want you to sit with. That's what I want you to feel the pain. And we could leave it here and we park it here. And that could have just preached to you and you'd be like, all right, I need to change this, this, and that. But here you go. I'm going to give you some very basic things in the rest of our time here together. And that is this. Number one, first thing I want you to look at is that how... God is going to offer hope. Hope is being offered. This man has a misfortune. It's fresh in his mind. It's painful. It's difficult. He's discouraged. And while the religious system of the day has failed him, there's a God who does not fail him. See, the Bible says that God shall never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? And so while God is able, the church might have failed, God is able to come in and do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or imagine, and God sends him a person. I've often said that if God wants to bless somebody, he'll send a person. If the devil wants to curse somebody, he'll send a person. And God sends a person to go and see this man with unfulfilled needs, and he says, I'm going to deal with this, with this guy. Verse 26, first thing I want you to understand is that it says, now the angel of the Lord said to, park it there. The angel of the Lord said to, what does your Bible say the next word is? What's the name? Come on, say it with me. What's the name? Philip. The angel of the Lord said to Philip. You know, I know that's what we read, but sometimes some of us have a dyslexic moment. We read Philip on the page, but in our hearts we believe it's Peter or John. And why do I say that? Because you know what? Who is Philip? Who is this man? You know, we could be thinking, you know what? I've heard the story of Jesus and the 12 disciples, and when I recount their names, I don't remember Philip being one of them. And if you are believing that and thinking that, you're correct, because Philip was not one of the 12 disciples. Philip is not part of the in crowd. Philip is a man that is from the outside. He's a foreigner. Philip is a Greek. And so here's what I want you to understand. If we go back to Acts chapter 6, we're introduced to Philip. Who is he? He's a man that was selected. Why? Because the church was growing exponentially. The church was popping, all right? And 3,000 were added to them in one day, and then 5,000 the next day. The church is growing by leaps and bounds. And you know what? In the midst of all that exponential growth, problems arise. 
Uh, reality check, side note, for those of you who are looking for the perfect church, let me just tell you, even the first church had a lot of problems. Why? Because wherever you have people, you have a tinder box for conflict. All right? Wherever there's people, it's a tinder box for conflict. There's no conflict right now. Just wait. It's coming. You didn't, no one's offended at you. Don't worry. They will be. And you know what? I, I, I hear it. I got it too. I can't tell you how many folks are like, Pastor, I just don't agree with what you did or what you said. And you know what? How come you didn't do this and that and whatever? I'm sorry. But you know what? If you want a perfect church, I'm just encouraged because not even the first one that Jesus established was perfect. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. But you know what? He did amazing things through them. Amen. He did amazing things through them. So side note for that. But here's the deal. We need to address this issue. The church has a problem. The widows for the Greeks are being you know, rejected while the, the Jewish widows are being taken care of in the distribution of food. And so they see that um, there's this problem, there's this tension, there's this conflict, and the apostles, the 12 disciples said, you know what, we have to do something about it. And you know what, we can't, if we look at Acts chapter 6, they say we can't be here dealing with taking care of tables, of, of handing out food and doing all this stuff. We need to be devoted to the teaching of the Bible, to prayer. We need to be teaching people and equipping people to be the saints of God. Therefore, we're going to select people from among you to take care of this issue. And the church agrees with the plan. They nominate seven people, and they say some qualifications and parameters of what these men have to have or do or be like. And so the second person on that list was Philip. And all of the names, not one of them, is Jewish. And so I want you to understand this here. Here's my point. That when God chooses to do the work of sharing the faith of evangelists, when God uses, chooses to do the work of discipleship, who does he use? Everyday people. He uses everyday people. He's not calling the pastors only. He's not calling those who are theologically trained. What is he doing? He's calling the regular people. Here's, here's the reality, church. Life is a myriad of variables. It's so many variables. Your experience is not my experience. You know what? Your history, Janet, is different than mine. Your upbringing, your culture, where you guys came from, Amani, is different than when I came from. And so that influences your culture, your home, the language, the every little thing. You know what? What I love to do is different than what you love to do right now. Though I cannot fix a house or build a house like you can. But you know what? You are different than I am. And because of all of this, it provides a diversity within humanity. And the point is that I cannot relate to everyone. I can't look at you and say, you know what, I'm so sorry. I know exactly what you're feeling. I've never been in a tragic accident where I needed to have so much surgeries done to myself. You know, I, I, I haven't been in your reality of, of going through a bankruptcy or this or that. I haven't gone through this or that. But here's the deal. Within the body, there's people who have collectively shared some resembling points. And when, where I can't meet every need, where Pastor Xavier can't meet and satisfy every need, the body of Christ can. And here's what I want us to realize is that when it comes to the work of evangelism, when it comes to reaching our world, what I should be able to do is say, I can't relate to you, Karini, but you know what? I know of somebody who has gone through what you've gone through, and I can make an introduction I hope I can make an introduction. I, I'm not a single mom trying to raise kids, but let me show you and introduce you to a single mom who's doing a stellar job right here in our church, and she can show you how she's doing it. Let me connect you with XYZ person who is going through the, the grief of a terrible loss and how they overcame it. See, church, God uses everyday people, and at least that's what should be the case. It's not John or Peter. It's not Thomas or Andrew. It's not any of the sons of Zebedee. He said, there's a man unfulfilled. He's on his way home. He's hurting. He needs answers. Philip, you go. Secondly, I want you to understand this and rebooting our discipleship is the fact that it is God's work, not man's work. The angel said to Philip, if you go to verse 29, the spirit told Philip. See, the ministry to the Ethiopian eunuch, it was especially arranged by God. Let's be honest and real here. If we go and we look at the history of what's happening in the beginning of chapter 8, 
We realize that Philip, there's persecution coming to the church. Stephen, another one of the men who were elected to take care of the needs of the widows, he has been stoned to death and martyred for the faith. Persecution has erupted. Those who are the elected seven, not the twelve, go out and they start preaching and teaching and spreading the gospel. The apostles remain in Jerusalem. But what happens? There's a revival that comes out in Samaria. God starts doing things. People start getting, whole villages are coming to God and Philip is preaching and teaching. He's on a high. He's excited and God is doing things. His attention is captivated. He is busy. He's got a lot to do. And in the midst of all that, Knock, knock, knock. Hey, Philip, I want you to leave everything. Philip, I want you to leave the big crowds, the church. I want you to leave all the the building programs and all the crazy evangelistic programs you're doing, everything that you're putting together. I want you to leave and I want you to go to the desert. And I want you to go talk to a man. See, Philip's natural inclination would have been to stay there. His own desire would have been to continue here because there's a need and I'm, I'm making a difference here. But he says, go. Church, here's the point. It is God's work to evangelize more than it is our work. You know, God is the one that's working on hearts and ministering to people. He's the one who's changing circumstances and rearranging things inside of people's minds. And so he says, go to the road, the desert road that goes down to Jerusalem and to Gaza. And what does Philip say? Uh, Where, God? Who am I meeting? Why am I going? God, is this the right idea? Do you have the right plan? Lord, is this the right strategy? Like, there is all this that's bumping over here. I need to take care of all this. No. He goes. Why? Because the work of evangelism is primarily a work of God. And we are partners in that work. Amen? God, like GPS coordinates, go down to this road. Go down to this region. You're going to meet here. Wait there. God gives. And church, here's one thing I want to bring out to us for application. You know what? Are we willing to serve like Philip is serving? Are we willing to make ourselves available and say, you know what? This is not my work. It's God's work. When we are are considering inviting Alpha people to come and and, and come minister, are we starting to really pray and believe God start working on their hearts? Because it's not going to be about what I say. It's going to be, Lord God, about what you're doing in their hearts. And so, Lord, go before me and start the work. God, go before me, and when I talk to my friend, my family who's going through pain and difficulty, go before me and do the work and help me, Lord Jesus, to the right place, the right time, and the right opportunity to share. I've heard, it's sad to say, I've heard in church that people are like, Pastor, I'm here, I'm available, I wanna wanna help, I wanna do this, I wanna do that. And then when you call and you ask and you invite, it's like, oh, I'm too busy, Pastor, I can't. How many people are gonna be there? I have honestly already heard in church people say, you know what, Pastor, I I would serve, I would sacrifice, I would give myself and of my time, of my resource, but you know what, I'm not going to because it's just a few people. If it was bigger and more, then maybe. But it's just a few, you guys got it. In church. Is that our attitude? Is that what we want to do? When we purpose in our hearts to witness and serve others, God shows up. Maybe if that's your attitude, what is it? Are you tired? Are you exhausted? When we do the work of God, he comes through with commensurate power. He helps us do the work that we have to do. What is it? You don't have direction. You're lacking direction. Man, he told Philip like a GPS coordinates. Go here, go there, stop here on this road, on that region. Da, da, da. You know what? If, if you are just saying, I need direction in my life. I need God to start speaking to me. You know what? What you need to do? You need to start refining and honing in your listening skills. And you want to know how you get good at your listening skills with God? Start serving him. You start serving him and saying, God, here I am, I'm available. Oh, believe you me, he's going to direct you. Why? Because God doesn't leave cars parked on the road. He directs them. He leads them and guides them. All right, I'm taking way too much time. Let me just give you one more, all right? Here's one more. I got more, but one more. Witnessing simply is pointing Jesus, pointing people to Jesus through the scriptures. We make this whole convoluted thing, like I have to know this, that, whatever, and all this stuff. It is simply this. It is pointing people to Jesus using the scriptures you don't have to sit here and do a seminary discourse you know defend a dissertation you are just pointing people to jesus it says then philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading isaiah the prophet do you understand what you are reading philip asked verse 31 how can i how can i 
I went to the church. Nobody said nothing to me. They didn't even let me in. How can I unless someone, that's why I came. I want someone to help me understand. How can I unless someone explains it to me? Philip did exactly what Jesus did. So many times Jesus shows up in people's lives and he just asks questions. We don't have to give people all the answers, guys. Can we just ask a question and let them go through it and deal with it and process it and and work with it and wrestle with it? How can I? No one explains it to me. And right here, it vocalizes for us a basic principle that runs all throughout the book of Luke and the book of Acts. It's that when it came to interpreting the Old Testament prophet text, when it came to interpreting everything the Bible said that was to come, an interpreter was needed. A Christian interpreter was needed. And we saw Jesus doing this all the time. He would open up the scriptures for them. And they would be encountering truth. How could this Gentile pilgrim who is out of context, does not understand the culture, doesn't get all of the nuances of every detail of how the word is connected to something else as a cross-reference, how could this man understand the real meaning of Isaiah's servant prophecy? A prophecy that if you were to look in all of the Old Testament, it's one of the most clear, amazing prophetic utterances about Jesus Christ that he would be bruised and broken for our transgressions, that by his stripes we are healed, that he is the one that was to come. Like all those amazing things that he reads there, it's all about him, Jesus the lamb, silent before his shearers, who would die, who we would remember at this table. I'm gonna wrap it up. Can I invite the team to come up here? Friends, I want you to understand this. When Philip said, Lord, here I am, because the work of evangelism is God using everyday people. When Philip said, Lord, here I am, I realized that this is more your work than my work. Philip was ready to meet this man and come alongside him. Why? Because he knew the scriptures. Imagine when he heard this man reading out loud. The guy looks at him and says, I don't understand this, Philip. What does it mean? And Philip says to him, Isaiah who? Is that in the Bible? Are are you just talking about the, the latest trend in pop culture or what came through on that show or this show? What the local buzz of what everyone's talking about? No, when he heard the man saying and reading, he said he he was looking at the scriptures. And he was reading that he was led like a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb is silent before his shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. When he heard all of this, Philip is like Isaiah 53 verses boom, boom, boom. I know what you're talking about. This man is seeking God. This man is reading the Bible. He doesn't belong here. He's a foreigner. He's a eunuch. This man was, oh God, I'm connecting the dots. You're sending me to this man who is leaving unfulfilled. Wow, he's got a need. The door is open, Lord. And what does it say? He goes on in verse 35. He goes on to say that beginning in that scripture, Philip started talking to him about Jesus. I remember in my life when I was going through a very difficult time, I had gone through my divorce. I was living a life that had nothing to do with God and I was mad and angry, I was hurting, I was depressed. I was just seeking ways to get even as opposed to get well. And I could care less about God and his church. But in my desperation, I came because deep down in the bottom of our hearts in the midst of our pain and our depravity and our pain and our sorrow and our addiction whatever it is there is a desire a yearning an unfulfilled inkling we just want to get well that we don't want to do this anymore that we want to get rid of the addiction and the drugs and this and that and the pain and the hurt and the rejection we want to be well so i found myself in a church service 
I came to a prayer meeting and Tony, you were there and Janet, you guys were there. It was in that all-purpose room and I came and I prayed. There was needs. People were praying about specific things like pray for healing for this and pray for my loved one who needs an answer to his documentation issues and, and this and that. And the pastor who was leading that prayer was able to see my yearning and my searching in some of the things that I was expressing in my pain and my sorrow. And that pastor adroitly took the word and started saying and giving me hope from the Bible. Not something that she knew, but something that she had read and said, yeah, this is far away. No, she knew it personally. Church, one thing that I want you to understand is how can we offer hope to somebody? How can we lead people to Jesus if we don't know him ourselves? How can we share the gospel and the word in times of need when people are hurting the word of hope, that rhema word that comes and changes hearts and minds when we don't have it buried in our hearts? It's just not possible. And in that moment, that pastor started sharing me promise after promise after promise of what was in God's word. And I wasn't ready to receive it, but it, 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 it launched in me a splinter. And I said, what if it was true? I left that place frustrated because I didn't want to hear some of the good advice that she was giving me because I was still angry and hurting. But you know what? It made me thirsty. And when this Ethiopian eunuch finds a man who was willing to say, Lord, here I am. I'm an everyday person. I know it's your work. And you know what? I have your scriptures hidden in my heart. I'm going to release it onto this man. It tells us down the road that he saw water right there and he realized that in in Philip teaching him, when we come to Jesus and we put our faith in him and we say, Lord, I want you to be part of my life, there is something that happens on the inside, but it's expressed on the outside of our bodies. We proclaim, we start declaring that God is for us. We start telling the world that we have made a change towards Jesus and we become baptized as an outward symbol of what happened in our hearts. And that eunuch said, I'm going to be baptized today. What stops me, Philip? He said, nothing. That man who came with hope deferred has hope offered. And finally, hope is found. Here's my closing. I didn't finish telling you the story about the man who wanted the violin. I invite you to stand with me as we wrap up our time. Back to Fritz Chrysler. He had come across the most exquisite violin he could ever imagine. He wanted it, but he had no money. He couldn't acquire it. He finally gets the money. He comes to him and says, I'm ready to buy it. Sorry, I sold it to a collector. Devastated, determined, he says, you know what? Who is the collector? And he finds the man. He goes to the collector's house and says, sir, I've waited. I've saved. I've done everything so I can acquire this beautiful instrument. And you know what? I am a musician. I am a professional. I play. He explained who he was and why he wanted the violin. But the man said, I'm sorry. I don't need the money. And I love this violin. It's become part of my prized possession and my collection of instruments. So I'm not interested and I'm not selling Imagine the pain, the unfulfillment in that moment. And yet, Fritz, as he turns to leave and go home, a thought comes to him. And he turns to the man and says, Sir, before you consign this violin to eternal quiet, can I just play it one time? Can I just play it one time? The collector says, Fine. You came all this way. Sure, have at it. Play it. Fritz picks up that violin in one hand, the bow in another, and then he begins to fill that room with such emotional music, such rich melodies and notes and transitions. And as the last note faded, enamored, that collector looks at him and he says, I have no right to keep this instrument to myself. I have no right to keep it. It's yours, Mr. Chrysler. You can have it. But he says, promise me this. You're going to take this instrument to the world and you're going to let people hear it. Christ is saying to us, church, you're a place to offer hope. I've given you the instrument of my message. I've given you the hope of my glory, the assurance of what I've accomplished. And I want you to let the world hear it. 
There's a lost and broken world that is in desperate need of salvation. I want you to proclaim those melodies. I want you to worship the songs and, and, and I want you to bring that praise. Because there's pain, there's rejection, there's hurt, there's addiction, there's brokenness, there's marriages falling apart. There's all of this that the world desperately needs. And who is God going to send? An everyday person. Who is God going to send? One who knows. I partner with God who does the work. And who is he going to send? A person who knows his scriptures. Amen? So I want you to just close your eyes with me right now. As we close, here we go. Do you know Jesus? Do you have a relationship with him? Because you will never be able to offer him to somebody if he's not for you already. If he's not yours. If you've never said, Jesus, I'm a broken man. I'm like this Ethiopian eunuch who needs you, who is searching for you. But I've never encountered you. If that's you right now, I want you to just raise your hand. I'm not going to put you on the spot. I just want to pray with you. Is there anybody here that needs to have their sins forgiven and need to find meaning and hope in Jesus Christ? Is that everybody here? Do you, do you know him? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you were to die today, you know that you would be spending the rest of your eternity with Jesus? Do you know him like that? Because that's the type of knowing you need in order to be able to bring hope to this lost and dying world. So I ask one more time, is there anybody here you've never, or maybe you've walked away from God? You said, whatever. You've gotten distracted. You've lost your focus. You've walked away from your faith. And you need to say, Lord, I need to come back to you. I need to pick up that violin and I need to share it with this world again. I need to know you intimately and deeply like Philip knew you. He had answers. He had scriptures. He had it all within him because you were changing his life. Is that you? Just raise your hand. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, forgive us for not being a hospital for sinners. Forgive us, Lord God, for being too preoccupied with our own things, attentions, agendas, dreams, and plans. Father, forgive us for not giving people the time of day when they come to us broken and hurting. Help us, Lord Jesus live a life that is worthy of the call that proclaims your death till you come that offers hope and healing and prayer and answers to those who are in need and father change us to be lord god a real representation of the church that you want us to be reboot us tonight we pray today this week in jesus name amen